Good afternoon. My name is Dave Callens from Philadelphia. I'm joined by Robert Chihak from uh, ECAM at Prague in Prague. And it's my pleasure to uh, adjourn the Ablation of Intercular Arrhythmias, Part 2. And uh, Michael Charo will give first a presentation. And the title is EKG Algorithm Trocade, the Origin of PVCs or VT. Thank you, Robert. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity to present today. Um, I think what I'm talking about um, is kind of a nice wrap-up of some of the cases, so hopefully you'll find it the same way. There are all sorts of different algorithms for VT localization on the ECG, and I feel very firmly that all VT cases should start with as much data from the ECG as one can muster. I'm going to concentrate on outflow tract tachycardias, both uh, PVCs and VT, it's kind of the same principles uh, in the algorithms that can help us with that. Um, I really like outflow tract tachycardias. You've seen some of these in the cases today, that how intricate the relationship between the anatomy and, as we'll see, the electrocardiography of this disease process is. The um, kind of the sphinx-like folding of the outflow tracts that Shiv showed in the first anatomical lecture. Um, this is what the real issue is here. It's not really the right ventricular outflow tract and the left ventricular outflow tract, although that's what we call it. It's really the anterior outflow tract and the posterior outflow tract, as the right ventricular outflow tract is leftward of the left ventricular outflow tract. You can also see from the anatomic specimen that there are a lot of other things in the neighborhood. There's a rich supply of both arteries and veins to be avoided or taken advantage of. Um, and the relationships of the outflow tract really make sense with the electrocardiography of the outflow tract. Finally, on the most uh, rightward part, uh, most leftward part of the screen, you can see how detailed these things are, how many different vantage points there are to get catheters to the outflow tract sites. I think this will be familiar to everyone that's here. This is just a nice way of making the key concept of understanding anterior outflow tract and posterior outflow tract. So this is a Sam Esservatham idea that looking at V1, if you're having arrhythmias from anterior sites, you would have a less positive forces in, the, in V1. So from the outflow tract, particularly the the free wall of the right ventricle, the most anterior part, there's no voltage in V1. And then as you step that back posterior, then all the way to the, to the mitral annulus, the R wave in V1 gets more and more positive. Just to make the point that anterior sites have less voltage force in V1 than posterior sites do. And take that one step farther, which is how we use this concept in our lab. <clears throat> not using just V1, but the R wave transition from positive to negative. So if you had an RV alpha tract sort of PVC or VT, you would expect the transition where the precordial R wave turns from left bundle branch block to positive forces very late because it's a very anterior site. So we'd see that in V4. Whereas in the LV alpha tract, we'd expect a sooner transition, usually as early as V2. Now that's a little bit of a troublesome word. Um, sometimes we use transition to say when it's more than halfway positive. Sometimes we say when it's fully positive. There's all sorts of variations. So that's the first kind of mucking up of what should be a really clear concept. If you're more posterior, you have more forces in the precordial leads. So in trying to put some, some bones around this, we had a, a paper a long time ago now that looked at PVCs that were coming from in between. So they had a precordial pre airway transition in V3. So not as late as RV outflow tract and not as early as LV outflow tract. And we also wanted to account for variations in ECG lead placement, particularly in the precordium, which can be very varied. And we're seeing um, now in the present even worse placement of ECG leads um, by the people that are doing these, these examinations than we used to see in the past. So could you use the patient as his or her own control and compare sinus to PVC? So this looks like mathematics, but it's really not that hard. So the first thing that they did was they looked at a retrospective analysis of 40 outflow tract VTs, and they looked at the transition ratio between sinus and PVCs in V2. So it'll be easier to show on the next slide exactly what we're looking at. 
it made this rule in this mathematics, and then in a prospective analysis of 21 VTs, they found a 91% predictive accuracy of LV origin. And if you had a transition that was greater than that seen in sinus rhythm, again, I'll show a picture in a second, that was 100% successful for RV. So the way that we do this first, the first rule in this is looking at the transition in the PVC versus the transition in sinus rhythm. If it's later than sinus, it's right ventricular outflow tract. If it's earlier than sinus, it's left ventricular outflow tract. If it's a tie, then it goes to this V2 transition ratio as shown in this slide. So basically comparing the R wave versus S wave in V2 from sinus rhythm to the PVC. If it's greater than sinus, if the ratio is greater in sinus, it like, it's likely coming from a left ventricular outflow tract. If it's not as strongly positive in sinus, then it's coming from the right ventricular outflow tract. And this works pretty well. And all of these algorithms are going to kind of be a starting point. It doesn't replace mapping, but it at least tells you where you want to place your catheters uh, for the first, first attempt at this. Um, another more recent way of looking at this is a, a very unique, and I, I really like this because it's using ECG leads that we don't often use, looking at V3R and V7. So even more rightward than the precordial leads usually go, and much more leftward and posterior. So they explored the use of these electrodes and a lot of other electrode sets in a, in a kind of a, a exploratory attempt in 119 consecutive patients. It makes sense that just like the transition ratio, they had a couple of patterns that were very predictive of either right or left-sided origin. If you have a QS pattern, in V3R, that makes perfect sense that it would be coming from the right, flow, right ventricular outflow tract because everything's going away. We're using precordial leads as unipolar electrodes, so they do have directionality. The same idea if you had an RS in lead V7, that indicated for sure left ventricular outflow tract. But when there was a tie, they used again another ratio, the R wave in V. 3R versus the R wave in V7. And that predicted, if that was greater, it predicted an LV alpha tract origin. Um, and they came up with an index of 0.58 that predicted an LV alpha tract origin with 87% sensitivity and 96% specificity. In a prospective group of 94 patients using this rule, there was a 95% predictive accuracy. And that seems to have outperformed the, the one that we came up with and several other algorithms as well. This is kind of the, the study of this, just looking at, and I, I think this particularly the middle part of the figure makes sense. If you had that big of, an, of a difference between recording sites, it would be very easy to bring out left versus right. One other thing that I wanted to point out, this is another thing that we came up with in Penn, this is very specific. So if you look at the ECG tracing during the PVC in this figure on the left, a notching on the downstroke of V1 seemed to predict an origin that was coming from a very specific place, not the right cusp nor the left cusp. We usually think of um, the cusp VT is coming from the very depth of the cusp. But this came from, very often, from the midpoint of the right and left cusp, and is really at the, uh, very much above the depths of the cusp at the raphe between them. So I bring this up not because of the elegance of this paper, which we, we were very taken by a long time ago when we came up with it, um, but the fact is we're struggling sometimes to do left from right, and now we're using this sign for a very specific spot. Just to introduce some skepticism, these signs are helpful when they point us in the right direction, but they're not to be taken um, uh, you know, as truth absolute. Because significant variation exists. So we had at the time of this, and this was never published, it was uh, reported in Heart Rhythm as an abstract. Um, this is kind of three examples of what we would expect right cusp PVCs to look like. So left bundle branch block, there's usually a, a, a positive forces in lead one, there's small R waves in V1 and V2, and a transition at V3. 
That would be the kind of typical pattern that we expect to see. However, in this series, there were a lot of patients that had those features, but had an isoelectric R wave in lead one. And then even stranger, there were people in the series that had a right bundle branch block pattern in lead one. So some of this is difference in the way that the ECG, are, are the pre-quarterlies are placed in the lab, a constant source of confounding. And some of this is the uncoiling of the aorta that happens in older patients. So significant variation exists, and I can't tell you that any of these algorithms will work perfectly in every patient. They tell you where a reasonable starting place for mapping would be. This is even a, a little bit more confusing uh, patient that I took care of very recently. And I'm not sure of the punchline of this, but it's a good transition point to the next set of points that I want to make. And this will really echo with some of the cases that we saw earlier today. So this is a, um, a young, healthy uh, physician, and she had uh, PVCs and had a, a failed procedure um, with ablation in the RV outflow tract uh, at an outside hospital. So when I saw her in the outpatients, this is the, this is the ECG that was recorded. And this has um, kind of all the findings of a right ventricular outflow tract um, septal site of origin, just as we would expect. So negative in, in lead one, and the first hint of an R wave is in V3, the transition's in V4. That sounds like RV alpha tract, perfectly so. Um, when we did an ECG, when she came uh, the day of her procedure, she had this ECG, so kind of looking more like what we were just describing with the typical form of right coronary cusp VT. So little R waves in V1 and V2, a transition in V3 that's in front of the transition sinus. So the punchline for the intermediate term was that she had an ablation from the septal site three of the RV alpha tract and all of her PVCs went away. Both the RV looking ones and the LV looking ones. So does that mean that this was really a deeper source that was sometimes exiting to the right, sometimes exiting to the left? If so, I hope that means that we got lucky enough. There's, if you look at that spot with echo, there's really not that much room between those spots, between the right cusp and the, and the RV alpha tract. I didn't go over to the, to the right cusp because the, the success was so apparent, but maybe I was fooled. Which really leads me to this consideration. So traditionally for both the RV alpha tract and the LV alpha tract and for the mid septum, which is even more of a, a problem which we saw in the cases today, we've gone to the earliest exit site and ablated there. So the work that Miguel and Furman were talking about mapping inside, mapping the epicardium, looking for vantage points or neighboring sites of spots that are really earlier within something that we would otherwise be unseen. We ablate the exit site, it might be very far away from where the site of origin really is. So the first way to kind of expect some of this too is also based on the ECG. And again, we saw some nice examples of this in the cases. So these are all different patterns of mid-septal VT or superior septal VT. Um, and so, kind of clues are that they're typically more narrow than you would expect. Sometimes they're confused in V1. They don't really fit a left bundle branch block pattern or a right bundle branch block pattern. And the one that we like the very most at Penn is this pattern break. So more positive in V1 than more negative in V2, more positive in V3. And again, that takes advantage of the idea that the precordial leads are unipolar leads. And so this pattern means that this is something that's coming from right under where V2 is recording. And that usually means the superior septum. It usually means that it would be better if we did some sort of venous recording to find out where this is really coming. This paper has been the most impactful one that I've read in the last year. And this is from the University of Michigan. And it shows a couple of things about this. So they're talking about PVCs for the most part. VT is a little bit more pr forgiving. If it's a circuit, then sometimes you don't have to get, there's no site of origin. There's no point of origin. It's a, a larger circuit. So you can sometimes come up with vantage points. Um, 
But what they found in this PVC paper is, first of all, these are all mid-septal VTs, and only some of them were mapped from the venous system. And that kind of makes sense from how hard you saw that these cases were today. For the most part, it's really hard to get enough practice to be able to do this venous mapping very well. But in cases where they just ablated an exit site, the success rate was about 67%. So it doesn't, the site of origin doesn't have to report to the, the closest part of the heart to be an exit site. It just could go anywhere. So when they could map, if they could ablate at the site of origin, either with a catheter like the, the case that Furman showed in his, in his lecture, or with alcohol, the success rate was 100%. When they couldn't get power into the site of origin branch of the vein, but could, could pick a close vantage point, like in Furman's case, that was also 100% likely to succeed. So knowing where the actual site of origin is, is much more uh, sanity provoking than ablating exit sites. So in summary, ECG patterns and algorithms, we love them. Um, and I think it's very nice to be able to understand the ECG and the anatomy, but they don't always work. A J at earliest activation in a given cham chamber has to be verified somehow. So mapping adjacent locations is one way pace mapping and getting an, a perfect match at the putative earliest site is another way of verifying or looking at a QS unipolar recording. All these can kind of give more, uh, more evidence that your catheter is actually over the site. Low frequency bipolar prepotential actually does the opposite. So a really broad, slow looking wave uh, predicts that you're not at the right spot, but the right spot is somewhere else close in the neighborhood in another chamber or in a close, uh, a close by to the, where you are then. And exit site ablation of mid-septal ventricular arrhythmias should not be expected to reliably work. Thank you for your attention. I'd like to introduce our next speaker, who is uh, Tarvinder Danjal from Coventry and he'll speak to us about omnipolar mapping guided VT ablation. Oh, thank you, David. Good evening. It, it's an absolute honor to be here among such a prestigious faculty, and I'd like to thank uh, Joseph for inviting me back here to Prague Rhythm. I'm going to talk to you about omnipolar mapping guided VT ablation. Just a few disclosures. So we're going to talk about the new X system. What is omnipolar technology? How does it work? Omnipolar technology in decrementing evoked potential mapping, and the new near field version 2 upgrade that comes with the NSIDEX system. So, the HD grid mapping catheter was a paradigm shift in substrate resolution to define SCAR. And this is one example of a number of studies that have published on this. This was work from our group that showed that what the HD grid enabled us to do was to refine the resolution of SCAR. So, SCAR was generally smaller with a smaller dense scar area with a larger border zone. And there have been a whole host of studies that have shown that scars with greater border zones are more arrhythmogenic. Omnipolar technology enables us to do three things well. Omnipolar max voltage, determining the maximum bipolar voltage in any 360 degree angle. Activation direction from the HD grid poles, importantly, independent of a far field reference. And also, we now have the ability to do something that conventionally was only being able to be done in basic science labs with optical mapping, and that's to look at conduction velocity, wave speed within the chambers. So how does omnipolar technology work? So the HD grid mapping catheter has 16 one millimeter poles, and the distance from the center of one pole to another pole is about four millimeters. And these 36 orthogonal bipolar pairs can be grouped into 36 triangles. And these triangles are called cliques. And at the center of each triangle is a virtual pole. Now, what you can see is an example of a sinus beat, and the P wave is being mapped. And using C4 to D4, and D4 to D3, you see the bipolar EGMs. Now, 
this creates a right angle triangle. And based on a time frame of over 100 milliseconds, an E field voltage loop can be created to look at the voltage at each of those X and Y planes at a specific moment in time. And by mapping that time frame, you can see that in the Y axis, which is D4 to D3, which is largely positive than negative, we see initial upward deflection and then downward. And if we look at the X axis, C4, D4, we see initial negative than positive. And this is why the voltage loop goes backwards and then forwards. But what the voltage loop does not enable us to do is to determine which direction the maximum voltage is in. Because the maximum voltage here can either be in this 156 degree angle where the green arrow is, or in the reverse direction. I think you have to indicate on this monitor, otherwise people cannot see it. Ah, okay, <laughs> thank you. So in order to work out the direction, we use a tool that we all use day in, day out in the labs, and that's the unipolar electrograms. So with the three poles from the clique, we have three unipolar wavefronts, and they are averaged into an average waveform of those three unipoles that we call phi. Now, a spatial derivative is applied to that wavefront, which gives us a phi dot wavefront. Now, there is only one direction where the unipolar averaged wavefront matches the bipole E-field wavefront. So, as I play this slide, you will see this arrow, black arrow, rotate around 360 degrees. And it's only in one direction that this E-field will match the unipolar phi dot field. So, hopefully this will play. And as you see that rotating, the E-field is changing because we're looking at a different angle of the omnipole. And as it swings round back to the 156 degrees, the wave front of the E field matches the phi dot. And this is where the system instantaneously uh, stamps the activation direction. So in terms of omnipolar technology, we've used it considerably in decrementing a vote potential mapping. And ultimately, what we are interested in doing is this is work that we did a few years ago in an in vivo swine model. And uh, uh, Bill Stevenson showed this schematic, which is taken from Debarker's circulation study, where it was described that we have zigzag lines of myocytes that is the reason why we see slow conduction. And what we showed, and, and uh, Debarker wrote the editorial for the paper, was that in fact, we showed a critical accumulation of other cells, myofibroblasts, at the VT exit sites. And these cells act as current sinks. They draw current from these myocytes, uh, potentiating slow conduction. And that's been shown in co-culture models. But ultimately, what we are trying to do in the EP lab is to determine the electrical signature of this abnormal cell-cell coupling. So in terms of VT mapping techniques, we have the conventional entrainment, activation, pace mapping, substrate lava, late potential mapping, and conduction channels. And conduction channels are, are where we are trying to identify functionally active substrate. And there's various ways that this can be achieved. Um, we've already had some discussion about ILAM, isochronal late activation mapping, from Roderick Tung's group in Phoenix. And we've seen some imaging ADAS data um, Ivor Rocca uh, from Spain has published more recently that the protectedness of an isthmus, which can be defined using MRI, also enables you to determine some functional element based on imaging and decrementing of potential mapping. So what are the fundamental, fundamentals of deep mapping? Well, we've got a schematic here of a scar and a stimulus and a channel in the scar. The stimulus results in two wave fronts, one at the top and one at the bottom. As you put in extra coupling intervals, as you shorten the coupling interval between the stimulus, there is a differential delay between activation into that scar. So you will have one limb that is conducting at its normal rate and another limb that is slowing down. You then, within a further extra stimulus or more aggressive coupling intervals, one of those limbs will block. An unidirectional block 
is the prerequisite to re-entry. So decrement precedes unidirectional block, and unidirectional block precedes re-entry. And this was eloquently shown by Andrew Porter Sanchez in this study, where you see red scar, you see all the letters A to K indicating uh, poles through a channel. And if we just concentrate on pole I, we see a far field, near field. Stim, far field, near field, which is, hasn't decremented because the cu coupling interval has remained the same. We see a stim, far field, then considerable decrement of the near field. Then we have a stim, which has blocked, but then the signal has activated in the reverse direction. So we've got block, which has then resulted in the initiation of re-entry. And th this is a list of the contemporary studies that have looked at the decrement, the coupling interval between an S1 and S2, unmasking these late potentials. And I think there's, two there's a clear difference between two, the two sort these studies that are done. One group of studies has focused on the actual difference in EGM prolongation between an S1 and an S2, what I believe is true decrement. And there are other studies that have focused on electrogram characteristics of the S2. And again, Bill, you've shown most of my slides. Um, this is another slide um, that we've had earlier, but it shows beautifully how Piaget, um, in 2012, there was no um, objective um, experimental analysis done on this data. But what you can see here is that with an S1, S2, and S3, these late components were unmasked. And this was back in 2012. Uh, the deep study, again, uh, published by uh, Porto Sanchez, this was a study where patients underwent both late potential mapping and deep mapping. And importantly, an eight-beat drivetrain was delivered before the S2. Another key important point is that the coupling interval between the S1 and the S2 was the ventricular effective refractory period plus 20 milliseconds, VERP plus 20. I'm emphasizing that because that'll be important later on. The clinical findings were that the deep area, the area that decremented, was smaller, considerably smaller than the late potential area. And with ab ablating the deep potentials, which were manually tagged, because currently there is no mapping system that will automatically generate a deep map. At the moment, it doesn't exist. So they have to be manually tagged. And you can see here that the deep ablation time was 30 minutes. And although the sensitivity was equally good as late potential mapping, the specificity was considerably improved. Um, in our hands, this was uh, the uh, impact VT study where we compared four different mapping catheters using a deep based ablation strategy in 73 patients. The HD grid arm, we had 33 patients. All patients had either ATP or shock, predominantly ischemic cardiomyopathy with poor LV function. We can see that we perform substrate maps and activation maps in a high number of cases with 1.5 VTs mapped per mean, um, substrate map time 37 minutes. And the blue line, the Kaplan-Meier curves, show the HD grid map cases. And over the course of a 12-month follow-up period, we didn't have a single patient come back with a recurrent shock, and one patient came back with ATP therapy. This was a study by the London group at BARTS, where a single extra was delivered, the BARTS sense pacing protocol. And you can see here that this is a sinus beat, this is a sensed extra, and from the sinus beat, where there's very little in the way of fractionation afterwards, with the sensed extra, you see this unmasking of these late potentials. Now, what was interesting in this study was that the area targeted for ablation with the extra was much greater. Because by creating a late potential map of the S2, you're not mapping decrement, you're not mapping delay from the S1 or the S2, you are simply mapping what is late with the S2. 
Um, Sharia Tatal, and this was for, in Europe Pace 2019, Paste Electrogram Featured Analysis. This again was a study that was focused on purely analysis of the S2. This was an eloquent study because they took patients with normal left ventricles, control patients, and 14 ischemic patients. And based on the S2 characteristics, they showed that if the EGM prolonged or if there was increased latency, what they described as type 1, type 2, or type 3 responses, these were more likely to be targets for ablation. So their ablation was based on the S2 electrogram having a duration of more than 120 milliseconds, or stim to EGM onset of more than 45 milliseconds. An ablation based with this approach, uh, the, su the success rate over one year was, uh, was good. So an example case, this is an 86-year-old male, post-MIVT with a CRTD, electrical storm despite amio and lignocaine infusions, EFR 30% with a prior CTO of the RCA. Here you can see the inferior wall. The green tags and blue tags are where we have manually tagged decrementing potentials. The substrate map shows what looks like a conduction channel running from the lateral wall to the, to the septum. Here you can see an example of uh, deep mapping. So we've got the S1 at uh, 600 milliseconds and then the S2 at 400 milliseconds, not VERP plus 20. And here with the S1, you see very little in the way of fractionation afterwards with a clear signal that's decremented out. And the green tags highlight nicely what looks like a channel, the manually tagged decrementing potentials. But the propagation map here in sinus rhythm doesn't really give you any clear identification of, of where a potential channel may be. Um, with the HD grid and inside X, you have the activation direction arrows, and these are very useful to look at activation into the channel. And what you do see here is arrows indicating entry into the dense scar from the top here and also into the bottom with collision somewhere in the middle of the scar. This is the wave speed. Now remember, we know that the slowest parts of a VT circuit are the turnaround points. So the entrance and the exit sites of the VT. The central isthmus actually conducts pretty well. And here in the wave speed map, we're still learning what these numbers mean, but certainly there is slow conduction potentially at what could be an exit site. So we induce VT very easily, and here we see a right bundle morphology VT with an apical exit from the inferior wall. Um, mapping in VT, we, as Roderick uh, tongue coins stamp mapping, strategic activation mapping. We'll place the HD grid in the area of interest, we'll induce VT, and immediately we see these mid diastolic potentials. So these are mid diastolic potentials at the mid isthmus. Um, we have exit isthmus signals and entrance signals. And if we play the VT propagation map, you see that part of the entrance is actually concealed. So we haven't mapped the entire isthmus, but we certainly got the larger components of the mid and exit sites. And this is using the tactile flexibility catheter targeting the mid isthmus in VT. And as soon as we get reasonable force um, at uh, 40 watts, we see VT termination. Now, this is the importance about manually tagging. So this is a green tag where we know is decrementing. And the, the last deflection map of the S2 Anything late is purple, overlies this nicely. So you can see the manual tag and a purple area. And what we can see if we measure the EGM duration from the S1 to the S2, the difference is 20 milliseconds. So this is genuinely decrementing. Here you see an area that's been tagged late as well, highlighted by the S2 late map. But here you can see that yes, the S2 signal is late, but the S1 EGM duration is 270 milliseconds and the S2 EGM uh, duration is really no different. So it's a, a false positive. And here, this is an area that's been labeled as late, but it's normal healthy myocardium that is just activating late as a result of the sinus wavefront propagation. Another interesting question is, what is the definition of decrement? How much decrement is important? 10 milliseconds, 20, 30, 40, 50. And what you can see with those late maps is that as you increase the definition of decrement, you do seem to 
reduce sensitivity but increase specificity. So the ablation strategy was to target the deep potentials and the isthmus uh, with uh, no VT inducible post uh, ablation. Now, several studies have delivered the S2 at VRP plus 20 to elicit decrement. However, there is no objective data to deliver the S2 at VRP plus 20. And numerous studies have shown that if you pace a normal ventricle aggressively enough, you will induce decrement. You will increase the activation time, the action potential duration, and normal physiological response. And so we addressed two questions relatively recently. What is the optimal S2 coupling interval to use and what degree of decrement is relevant? And this is currently in press in Europace. And to, just to give you an example, this is the HD grid mapping catheter at the same location in all three different pacing or coupl uh, coupling intervals. So we tested an S2 coupling interval of 400 milliseconds, an S2 coupling interval of the VT cycle length from the ICD data, and the S2 coupling interval of VRP plus 20. And you can see that as the S2 coupling interval is brought shorter, the level of decrement at this same catheter location increases. If you look at the bipolar EGMs of the S1 beats, they're absolutely identical. So it shows that the catheter is stable in the same position. In this second example, you see a discrete potential that decrements out by 92 milliseconds when the S2 is at the VT cycle length. And it blocks with VRP plus 20. And this example at the end, you see no decrement with the deep 400 coupling interval or the deep VT cycle length. However, when you pace aggressively at VRP plus 20, you do see some delay. Whether this is relevant or not, these are the questions we wanted to address. So the study was to create a substrate map. So each patient had a substrate map, and then at the same catheter location, three different deep maps. Deep maps were generated offline, and with each different deep map, with a coupling interval at 400 or VT cycle length or VRP plus 20, we then created five additional maps by changing the definition of decrement. What is the right definition to use? 10, 20, 30, 40, or more than 50? All deep maps were compared to the gold standard VT activation map in terms of sensitivity and specificity analysis. So in each case, we had 17 maps and 15 deep maps in total. Uh, the, this shows the generation of the offline maps. So we took the EGM duration of the S1 signal and subtracted it from the EGM duration of the S2 signal to create what is a true decrement map. Now you can see in this example of a deep 400 case, as we've increased the definition of decrement, you can see that the purple area, the decrement area, reduces significantly. And so by looking at the deep 400, deep VT cycle length, and deep VRP sensitivity and specificities, we see that as we increase the threshold for decrement, the sensitivity falls and the specificity increases. And the trend was similar for all three different S2 coupling intervals that we tested. And indeed, the optimal threshold appeared to be approximately 20 milliseconds. And the rock curve analysis suggested that the deep VRP was outperformed by the deep 400 and deep VT cycle length coupling intervals. Does this translate into reducing the ablation target area? Yes. Now, when we compare the absolute deep areas using the 10 millisecond definition compared to the 20 millisecond definition, we see a near 50% reduction in the ablation target area. And all these patients underwent deep 400 guided ablation, and over six month follow up, um, there was a 92% freedom from NEVT. Now, the final point I want to talk about very briefly is signal annotation. The new NSIDEX system with the version 2 upgrade enables us to target near field signals more accurately because the signal annotation is based on peak frequency. And you can see here that with the old version 1 software, these mid diastolic potentials were not labeled because the sub-interval was focused around the high energy signal. Here we see that the near field signals, which have a higher peak frequency, are now annotated correctly. 
So the near field looks at peak frequency. You can generate peak frequency maps and emphasis maps. And I'll just show you briefly what they are. This is a 59-year-old male with AVC, 59 ICD shocks. We epicardially mapped his RV and we could see low voltage substrate on the free wall with the green dots showing decrementing signals. No real difference between the substrate maps. If we look at the near field uh, activation map compared to the last deflection map, the last deflection map has highlighted tagged some noise, whereas the near field peak frequency map does appear to be cleaner. Looking at the peak frequency map from the outside, looking at the parietal pericardium and the visceral pericardium from the inside, we can see that the peak frequency maps have highlighted the free wall quite nicely. And this is what an emphasis map looks like. So this is where we've overlaid substrate on top of the peak frequency. And you can see quite nicely when you're looking from the inside of the pericardium, the visceral pericardial surface, you can see an area of low voltage and peak frequency right on that RV free wall area. So this was, uh, you can just, I've shown some deep uh, mapping here, uh, S1, S2, EGM prolongation, here, S1, S2, a very fractionated low voltage signal that's decremented. On that RV free wall, we had a 90% pace map, VT was easily inducible with a single extra. Um, here we're mapping with the HD grid and we bump terminated on the, on the mid-diastolic potentials. And with the Tactiflex at 40 watts, what's nice with the Tactiflex is now it's caught up with Smart Touch in terms of we've got an arrow. Um, and with the arrow, you can focus the ablation onto the epicardial surface. And what was quite nice here is that all the ablation lesions were onto the visceral side of the pericardium. And when we did an endocardial RV map, uh, a lot of the lesions that we deployed epicardially came into the shell of the uh, endocardial RV map. And a final VT stim, uh, nothing inducible with the uh, three extras, pre-ablation and post-ablation maps. And my final slide, we've talked about HD grid and omnipolar technology with three poles. And I found this an absolutely fascinating study um, by Jose Marino's group. Um, and this was published this year in the Journal of Computers and, and Biological Med um, Medicine. And rather than taking three poles, uh, the group looked at four poles. And by looking at four poles using Monte Carlo simulations, they looked to see whether the E-field loops could be made more accurate. And indeed, what they showed quite nicely in this um, computational modeling study was that with four poles uh, creating a virtual bipole in the center of the diagonals, this uh, improved both the amplitude and the estimation of local activation times. Whether this translates into clinical application, who knows? So in summary, OT overcomes unstable reference catheter signals, tachycardia cycle length variations, and catheter orientation. Integration of OT with functional substrate mapping is feasible, and we've certainly shown that with uh, deep mapping. Uh, the near field upgrade enables peak frequency maps and em emphasis maps. And I think some future advancements are maybe to look at the four poles to make up a clique, peak frequency in structural heart disease. We're seeing increasing work done looking at peak frequency in the atrium. And um, the next step, certainly, uh, I think with deep mapping is deep mapping automation, creation of maps that are, that are true automated deep maps. Thank you very much. Uh, the next presentation will be given by Katja Zeppenfeld. Do we need to look for functional component of the substrate. So, Katja, please. Thank you very much. So first of all, it's a pleasure to be here today, and I think I can skip my talk because it has already been given, but um, I will look at it from a different perspective, perhaps a little bit. So the answer is certainly yes, but still activation mapping, enshrinement mapping, slowing VT, and terminating VT during F is considered the gold standard to really to really prove that the size that we are mapping is involved in a VT circuit. And this is actually currently our gold standard to, like it was nicely um, uh, illustrated, to, to def de define or to, to determine sensitivity and specificity of new criteria. But we know that a lot of patients are not uh, not uh, inducible in the lab. There are a lot of unmappable VTs, and it's really difficult to say if all the ablation, uh, all the mapping features we now develop also apply for very fast VTs because we actually validate them by mapping slow VTs. 
So, but the gold standard, because of this, uh, this fast VTs, uh, has become substrate mapping. And the late potentials were a very, very early target, and the late, the late potentials indicate the late activation of the via myocardium during baseline rhythm. This is a typical uh, old voltage map, I would say. So, if you combine late, poten but, uh, late potential mapping with pace mapping, and you find a very good pace match with a delay from the stimulus to regress complex, then you may argue that this is a critical VT reentry circuit site mapped during stable rhythm, at least in this huge, large uh, scars. But for many patients, the potential VT substrate is not always evident during baseline rhythm, and therefore functional substrate mapping has been introduced. And there are, in general, two different strategies of functional substrate mapping, or there are two strategies proposed. One is changing wavefront directionality, and the other is uh, decremental stimulation. And this is not a new concept, actually. It's more than 20 years ago that Dr. Bakker has performed this in human explanted Langendorf perfused uh, hearts. These so are patients with DCM and post infarct patients. And they have compared the histology of epical recording sites using high resolution mapping, this was the unipolar mapping. And they have cre created activation maps during pacing from different sites. Here, this is 600 milliseconds S1. And have compared it with the histology, and you will see the strengths of fibrosis. Um, and at site A, there is a nearly a, a perpendicular activation wavefront. And this is shown here the activation map. At site B, it's, it's parallel to the fiber direction, and the activation delay is not significant. So, and then they gave, gave extra stimuli, again, not a new concept. And if you look at site A, you see already with 400 milliseconds this irregularity with functional conduction block if you further uh, decrease your couplings interval with a low total activation delay of 68 milliseconds. In contrast, if you paste from site B, not too much is happening. The maximum activation delay in this particular um, uh, area was only 10 milliseconds. So, this data suggests that simply changing the wavefront probably does not solve the problem at least for, for this kind of substrate where we have inhomogeneous uh, scars. We cannot perform really multi-site uh, uh, um, mapping in the lab in patients. So probably you can paste from two sites or maximum three sites, and otherwise it's not feasible. But you can simulate multiple site pacing and also extra stimuli pacing in a, uh, in a model. And this is a very nice recent paper, and they have actually used um, patient data so from imaging the post-infarct patient, the scar for the model, and have induced VT. And then they have done two things. They have first looked at S1 and extra stimuli, and they have determined if, uh, if the results can better, uh, better um, uh, identify the inner VT circuit. And this is here shown here, the under, uh, area under the curve, so the accuracy for the inner part of the circuit. And if you just pace with S1, it's moderate. But if you apply extra stimuli, in particular if you're close to the circuit, your uh, diagnostic performance for the inner VT circuit is much much better. In contrast, if you do multiple side pacing, this is shown here, so it will be difficult to explain. So these are 50 different pacing sites. And this is S1 only, and you see the, the, the accuracy here. This is in moderate 0.7. But if you pace with an extra stimuli, you already uh, outperform your multiple uh, site pacing, and if you perform extra stimuli from multiple sites, you are quite, in the model, quite good to, uh, to diagnose your inner part of the VT circuit. So accordingly, my, uh, extra stimuli mapping has been performed in several labs, and uh, this was actually nicely summarized already. Mostly performed with RV apex pacing, mostly performed in patients with post-infarct scars. And this is also very important. There are not too many data in any other pathology, in particular not in patients with non-ischemic carpathy. So usually uh, pacing is performed from the RV, but the, the, the frequency, so when, so where and how this pacing is performed, and also the interpretation of a positive response was different. So deep mapping has been ex extensively explained already, and this was initially performed if you record already a late potential or a functionated EGM in the left ventricle. Then there was this hidden slow conduction mapping, and this also required some suspicious of an abnormal electrogram. We have performed what we call evoked delayed potential with, um, uh, with, um, um, with a hypothesis that you have to do it at any site where you have a low voltage area. And I will come back to that a little bit later. So we only uh, rely on the bipolar voltage amplitude 
with a normal catheter and then as, um, as the, two, the other two protocols have already been explained so they just have used excess stimuli after every seventh or fifth speed uh, and then if you look at the positive uh, response and this was also already explained so what we consider functional substrate mapping then there are also different definitions uh, we use a clear split of the second component I will show this in a second this was also originally done by the deep mapping group others use any delay or any increase in duration latency or any late potential or any abnormal activity following S2. So it makes it a little bit difficult and probably prone to operator um, interpretation. This has already been shown and this is really a very nice study because it's the first time that they hypothesized that light, light potentials that do not show this decremental activation that they are less likely to participate in a circuit than, uh, than electrograms that show this um, delay but again here the, the, the far field and the, uh, and the near field which shows here the same coupling interval but in this, in this side you see already that during the train uh, it delays and then here it was blocked they have simultaneously created interoperatively this interoperative um, balloon mapping, different maps. This is one example of one patient. This is a bull's eye reconstruction where you see the apical lateral scar. This is an activation map during VT, and you simply see that the, that the diastolic pathway here better co localized with a deep map than with a light, late potential map. We have learned, and this is a very nice work from, from uh, Anta in the animal model of an early perfusion uh, myocardial infarction, that you may have more functional components of the circuit, like we have seen in, in, in Dr. Bucker's work. And this is a typical figure of eight circuit with the entrance, the, the central uh, isthmus, the exit, and the and outer loop sides. If you look at this example, and this is a very fast VT, 250 milliseconds, you see here the central isthmus, which is bordered by boundary, and you see here the uh, increased density uh, of the isochronal suggesting that the boundaries of this circuit are actually functional rather than fixed. And this particular uh, reperfusion model is quite interesting because we have more and more patients, we have, today we have seen a lot of these large transmural scars, but we see more and more patients with early reperfusion uh, and they have different scars and we have, um, in, together with a group in Aarhus, have um, had a model with a very early perfusion and then you very often see this kind of scar. So they are not transmural, have a subendocardial rim and then this kind of fibrosis which is separating the subepicardium. And we were interested in the electrical characteristics of this scar and we have done the same protocol that you have seen already also in this PIC model. And this is pacing doing as one we have taken and this is also in the lab um, the refractory period plus 50 milliseconds simply because it's more practical because sometimes you lose your capture with a plus 20 milliseconds so we are a little bit more liberal. Uh, but, but the point I want to make is this is during RV pacing in the baseline and you see here bipolar voltage of 2.5, um, 4 or 5 millivolt with a conventional uh, uh, tip catheter. So if you apply the extra stimuli you see um, clearly split out of the second component which is lower in voltages and we believe that this electrogram comes from the subendocardial layer uh, whereas the, the, uh, which, is, which is hidden actually in the far field uh, of the subepicardium and requires some, some extra stimuli to get this functional conduction delay. And this is an example of a patient. This is not done with multi-electrode mapper, but mapping, but just with a normal um, uh, apple ablation catheter in a patient with an early perfusion of a circumflexa infarction, fast VTs, you can see here's a VT, in use VT morphology. And this is the voltage map, like what it would look like if you uh, use a conventional 1.5 millivolt uh, for abnormal voltages after myocardial infarction. So we have performed this evoked potential, uh, evoked delayed potential on mapping, and we do this now whenever we have a bipolar electrogram um, uh, amplitude of less than 3.0 millivolt. And I come back to this cutoff in a second. The point I want to make here is that at, at several sites we had already a second component, and like in the animal model, but this is now in baseline. You see the far field, which is quite big, which gives rise to the normal voltages in this area, and then the second component. And after S2 some delay or the split here to t more than 10 milliseconds, a positive response here, a positive response here, but this for instance would be a negative response, there is no activation delay um, and we would not target this and similar in this, uh, in this uh, example where the second component is all of a sudden hidden in the big, com in the big component, so we consider this as not significant delay. Of interest, if you adapt your mapping window to the 
the delayed component, and this is shown here, then all of a sudden you see the subendocrine scar, and this is the MRI in this person, a patient showing a subendocrine non transmural scar. This is a segmented scar like projecting uh, on the endocardium, and you can nicely see that this fits uh, with a scar which we have just identified by annotating the voltage of the, sec of the after uh, S2 of the second component. So if you don't have MRI, and I would like to come back to our cut off values, you can also use your standard bipolar voltage. And for, for this purpose, we have performed a, a very nice study with Marek Schramko from this institute, actually, when he was visiting Leiden. So we have performed MRI in post-infarct patients. We have done voltage mapping. We have image integration in the lab. And then we have exported all the mapping data and have superimposed, and this is a very old workflow from our lab, uh, we have superimposed all the mapping points on the original MRI slices. For this study, we have subdivided our post-infarct patient population in two different groups, those that have a small scar and a very or a normal function of the, of the, of the uh, remaining left ventricle, so good contractility of the, of the other walls, and those patients that have an adverse remodeling, meaning that they have a scar, but they have also a poor function of the, of the remaining left ventricle, where we think there must be more fibrosis due to this adverse remodeling. And it makes sense to have probably different cutoff values, because in the end, bipolar voltage is a kind of marker of unipolar voltage and bipolar of the while myocardium activated, and you have diffuse fibrosis in less while myocardium left or wall thinning in the remaining left ventricle, then the voltage should be lower and the cutoff would should be lower. So what we have done is we have taken all the mapping points remote from any scar, including those here where you have still some non-transmural scar, and based on these mapping points, we have like, what was very often done, uh, uh, introduced a new cutoff value based on the 5% percentile, so 95% of all mapping points had a larger voltage of a, a certain cutoff, and came with 3.0 millivolt for the non-remodeled LV and 2.1 millivolt for the remodeled LV. And this is one example where you see now the CMR derived scar, and this is any scar, any uh, in, at any site um, in the wall, and this fits nicely with a cutoff of less than 3. Point, uh, um, uh, zero millivolt, and this is shown for the entire patient population. So, if you take these adapted uh, or adjusted cutoff values, then we had a very nice um, match uh, with a low voltage area and any LGE. Uh, uh, on uh, contrast enhanced MRIs, and this is a rationale to say, okay, we start mapping with the extra stimuli when we have a voltage, uh, bipolar voltage, uh, during standard catheter mapping of 0 0.3 for the non-remodeled and 2.1 for the remodeled, negatively remodeled LV. And this is just an example of our patient where you just adapt the, the threshold to 0 0.3, and it fits much better with your MRI-derived SCAR than if you use a standard 1.5 millivolt. So I believe that in particular for these patients where you have these small non-transmural scars, the functional subset mapping is really uh, superior also in terms of outcome. And we do this approach since 2013, uh, and this is, a, is our standard approach in the lab for many years now. In 2018, Marta Driva from my group has put together our first results, and we had two-thirds of our post-infarct patient population who had this what we call hidden substrate because the electrograms were not obvious during sinus rhythm and had normal voltage area. So we would usually not do any extra stimuli there if you would search for late potential abnormal electrograms up front. And in one third of the patient there was just this huge overt um, low voltage area with the confluent transmural scars where I believe the 1.5 millivolt voltage threshold is still okay. And if you look at the outcomes and the hidden substrate group was doing much better. Uh, this is, by the way, the procedure time less than three hours and the RF time for the entire group 15 minutes. Uh, but this is, of course, not a very honest comparison because those with the overhead substrate, they had poor function, large scars, dense scars, and more often clinical heart failure. So the outcome is to be expected poor in this patient population. So we have made a propensity match um, analysis with our uh, prior uh, patient population where we did not perform this kind of, um, of approach. We have matched in particular for LV function and the scar area on our mapping data. And you see that also in this, in this if you do this propensity match, then in particular those with smart smaller scars, uh, outcome was better. This is a historical control group, again, matched for this parameter. In patients with the overt substrate, there was not too much additional benefit from this functional substrate mapping approach. 
The last point I want to make, if you have such a, a workflow, which you can which you can measure and which you can remap also so with also having good endpoints this may overcome the operator dependency on the interpretation of the electrograms and perhaps also operator dependence on ablation outcome and we have tested this in the netherlands and in um, in denmark so we have invited colleagues from five centers to our hospital. We just had one meeting uh, at, at our site where we explained the approach, we, we discussed the interpretation, what is an evoked delayed potential, and all centers did not do it in the, um, in, in the past, and they in general have sm a little bit smaller VT ablation programs than in our center. And they all agreed on the same uniform protocol, uh, the same ablation and the same follow-up protocol, and we have included 130 patients, post-infarct VTs, and you can see that they, they were quite, quite, uh, quite okay with, with actually performing the protocol. 98% uh, of the patients did, the, did undergo uh, this functional substrate mapping. Any EDP was defined, uh, identified in 93% actually. 98% were elim eliminated. And then on in usability after this approach was 78%. Again, with a reasonable median procedural time of a little bit more than three hours and their F time 23 minutes. And if you look at the results, and this is just um, for the follow up, um, the details will be, um, um, will be uh, presented. Uh, very sh very soon. <laughs> uh, so we have um, um, a median follow-up of uh, 14 months and what you see, the point I want to make is that the VT3 survival in our center and those centers that just started the approach was quite similar. So if you have a clear definition of a target which is supported by exp experimental and clinical data, you may reduce operator dependency at least to a certain extent on the interpretation of the EGM and perhaps the related ablation outcome. Thank you very much for your attention. Our next lecture is uh, pre-recorded, and it's by Andrea Natale in uh, Austin, Texas, endocardial scar homogenization with versus without epicardial ablation in VT uh, post-MI. Good afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure to uh, uh, give this presentation at uh, uh, Dr. Carl's meeting. Um, sorry that I'm not there in person, Hopefully next time I'll be more uh, efficient with my my schedule. So uh, with uh, uh, Joseph, uh, uh, we agreed I was going to talk about uh, endoepicardial approach for VT ablation in ischemic homeopathy. Uh, obviously, I think this extends to all patients with structural disease. I'll show you some data. The, the importance uh, of doing uh, the best we can uh, uh, to achieve freedom from VT when patients come uh, to our lab. Uh, with ICD shock is uh, driven by data that are now out there to show that if the VT is uh, eliminated, uh, patients have a better survival um, regardless of the underlying cardiomyopathy and the ejection fraction. This is from a large registry that uh, many centers were part of, uh, I believe, and even Joseph. Um, and recently, uh, the Partita trial show that uh, uh, after a single shock, uh, ablation uh, does uh, um, result uh, in uh, obviously better uh, recurrence uh, follow-up, but also uh, impact on hospitalization and all cause of that. Obviously, this is driven by the approach that we're doing today, and now we'll talk about what, what is the difference. So the question when we ablate uh, uh, patient with structural IPC is, uh, what do you consider the end point? Uh, when do we stop burning? Uh, well, for many years, uh, we've used uh, sort of the mapping uh, and ablation approach, which certainly is satisfying because you see the VT, the stop as you're ablating. But is that the best uh, for the patient uh, when we look at long term freedom from uh, uh, NVT? So, uh, again, uh, what is the end point that you should keep in mind? Is the elimination of uh, a non-inducibility of the clinical VT only, elimination of a non-inducibility of all the VT that we see, uh, reduction of ICD shock and follow-up, and maybe, and this is, I think, something that uh, I will discuss, freedom from VT off anterior drugs, which is not trivial because most of the time the anterior drugs that especially take is amiodron, which has been associated with increased mortality in our failure population. So this is what we've been doing for 
many, many, many years. And uh, although it works in the lab to identify the ISMOS, uh, does that give you the best outcome? When you look at this study, which is a multi-center, that led to the approval in the US of open irrigation for VT ablation, you see that there are six months, more than 50% of the patient had recurrent. So although you, you see a significant reduction of OICD shock, still many patients continue to have VT, and most of these patients are still on anti drugs. So uh, which are the other issues with the induction and mapping? But first of all, many of these patients have unstable VT. Sometimes the VT are not inducible. Uh, because program simulation is unreliable. Um, and then many patients come to the lab loaded with antiretinic drugs, and that can prevent to induce some relevant arrhythmia, especially if the goal is to stop those medications eventually and follow up. So let's look at the past, because this is relevant to what I'm going to say. So this is a, what they used to do with surgery. They used to map identify the area of interest with the activation, but then the best outcome were obtained not by just, just targeting the spot, but they, by eliminating the entire scar, so endoepicardial resection of the entire scar. Um, based on sort of this uh, understanding many years ago, and this is the first paper that our group published in 2012, uh, we look in ischemic cardiomyopathy, and for this study, which was not randomized, we took patients that did not have uh, cardiac surgery, so we encourage, uh, we try to do endo in the group undergoing homogenization. And you see here we have uh, uh, 92 consecutive patients, 49 that only have endocardial ablation uh, with the standard approach, and the other group had endo homogenization. Um, and you see at 25 months, a huge difference uh, in freedom frame from any from NVT shown here in the graph, but also a much larger number of patients uh, in the homogenization group was able to stop anti drugs. So that's, that was a, sort of the other benefit. So not only freedom from NVT was increased, but also increase of anti drugs. Now, uh, uh, there are many similar strategy called in different ways you see here, uh, channeling, uh, late potential, <laughs> scar modulation, which is our approach, scar channeling, the core isolation. So they are all substrate-based strategy uh, with different name, but overall the same concept to uh, try to target the scar uh, regardless of the induction. We also subsequently did a randomized study, and in this study, actually, we, we selected a patient that came uh, to the hospital in stable VT, and they were randomized again to the standard approach and a substrate based approach. And again, you see huge difference in freedom from, from any VT. Um, uh, and also, when you look here, uh, there was a, a huge difference in ability to stop antiretic drugs. Uh, between uh, the substrate base versus uh, um, uh, the standard approach. Uh, the only 12% 12 12 of the patients in the substrate base were still on the drug versus uh, almost 60% with the standard approach. So the question is, is inducibility really important? So I'll show you a case. Um, they came to us again, typical, you know, they're loaded on amiodar, also lidocaine, the multiple CD shock, and this is the endocardial scar, this is the homogenization, and after the patient is non inducible uh, with triester stimuli, uh, and we go epicardial, and in the epicardium we see all this uh, additional substrate that was ablated, and uh, the patient then uh, left the hospital, offered me other and did not have recurrence letter. So we more recently look at that. Um, in a group of consecutive patients that uh, uh, were non-inducible after endocardial homogenization, and despite that, we went epicardially and ablate. And then we look at the five-year follow-up. So there are 70 patients that uh, had uh, endo and the rest uh, just endocardial ablation. And then at five years, um, we have uh, uh, 81% uh, freedom from VT, recurrence in the endo AP versus 63 in the endocardial ablation only. Uh, with again, 
a sort of much likely, likelihood of stopping the antiretroviral drugs in the group with the NOAP uh, homogenization. You see at the number, uh, only 45% uh, of our still on some antiretroviral drivers, so 89 in group uh, uh, 2. So the majority of group 2 patients are still taking some, some antiretroviral. Uh, and this is the couple of Meyer uh, difference of five years uh, between the endo-AP in red and the endocardial longitization group. So uh, is this result unusual? Uh, well, this is a series from uh, uh, Shiv Kumar for the UCLA group, again showing that uh, in ischemic cardiomyopathy, whenever endo-AP was, was used, had a much larger success rate of follow-up, as you see here. So they say actually 85 versus 56 percent. So similar to what uh, our group is reporting in this series, this is another series from uh, uh, Spain, again showing in a small number of patients that the endo-AP in 15 patients was associated with a, a much lower recurrence rate uh, than the endocardial approach only. Uh, and this is a, a, um, uh, also another series, uh, again, from Spain, where you, uh, you have three groups, one group uh, endo-only, mm -hmm. Uh, with the subendocardial MI, uh, group yeah. 2 endo AP yeah. that has transburial MI, yeah. and then uh, the, the group with transburial MI, they only have endocardial, yeah. and you see that the group with the transburial MI that have endo AP had uh, um, uh, success rate similar to the group, they only have a subendocardial sub uh, scar, uh, and the group with transburial MI have much low uh, worst outcome. Um, this is a, like a case report of a patient that had three uh, previous ablation with endocardial uh, ablation only, all terminated because the patient became unusable. He continued to have recurrent, and eventually, uh, with, a, with the fourth procedure, he had epicardial ablation, showing that the, the seer could probably have some sort of entry endocardially, but uh, without affecting the epicardial axis, uh, the epicardial substrate, you may the patient on usable only transiently. So this is another example of uh, uh, cases like this. Um, uh, similar results uh, have been uh, reported uh, by uh, the group in uh, Brazil, Salamac, again showing that in patient here uh, that have the endo epi approach, and this is both ischemic and non-ischemic, success rate is higher than in the group that have only endocardial approach, which is the NC group here. So several group has really reported it. Another piece of information that I want to show you is that when we look at our um, uh, experience with uh, radiation therapy. Those are all patients that fail in our lab, at least a couple of procedures. The majority of those are, are ischemic, and all of them became non-usable at the end of the endocardial approach. Obviously, we could not do the epicardial because of the scar from the surgery, and the patient are considered high risk. That's why we consider radiation therapy. But this is another example of how we can make an epicardial substrate inactive acutely with the ablation, uh, but that is not going to last uh, uh, long term. Uh, same, similar results have been reported with other cardiomyopathy. I'll go very fast with this because this is a, uh, just to show you that also in, in idiopathic cardiomyopathy, there are data, this is from our lab, showing the benefit of the endo AP approach, as you see here, not as big as in ischemic because many of these patients uh, have some mid myocardial scar that is not affected by the substrate approach, but the endo AP approach certainly is more effective than the endocardial approach only. Uh, also, um, in patients with ravitrial dysplasia, actually our group, based on some data from the panel group, published the first series of endo epicardial approach in 2011, showing that with, uh, with the endo epicardial approach, there was no uh, late recurrence that we used to see with the endocardial approach only. Um, and uh, uh, this data then has been uh, confirmed by, by several other groups. This is the one from Brugada showing similar uh, results to us. And then a meta analysis putting all this data together showing uh, improved success rate without any impact on mortality in procedural, co uh, procedural complication. Same for Chagas disease. This is a randomized study from a, a group in. Uh, 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 deal 
showing uh, uh, the benefit of endothelial approach. And the last group, hypertrophic abdominopathy, where there are two larger study, one from our group, um, showing uh, an increased success rate with the endoepicardial approach, and the other one from Viver Ready uh, and other center, again showing this, exactly the same result. And this is a large meta analysis looking at uh, the impact of endoepicardial homogenization on outcome. And with all these patients together, um, we actually saw that. Uh, uh, Beside the benefit on recurrence uh, of VT, there was an impact on mortality uh, at uh, follow-up, as you see here. The end of approach was also associated with the reduce of all-cause mortality. So um, this is a summary that uh, clearly uh, um, not, not based on inducibility, but based on substrate alone. Uh, probably uh, the more the, 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 art, the ischemic cardiomyopathy patient that we see today have a more a different type of MI that require more frequently uh, epicardial ablation, and this is associated with the better results. So uh, less is not necessarily the best thing. And I hope so. I propose you an approach that obviously is uh, not uh, still accepted, and uh, I, I hope that my proposal will not take as long to be accepted. Thank you very much. Presentation is epicardio access using carbon dioxide insufflation. And Joe Stilzwaller. Thank you. Thank you to the organizers for inviting me and thank you for staying. Um, so um, I think my talk leads on quite nicely from, from what we've just heard because um, it, it's about getting to the epicardial space uh, more safely. So um, this is the sort of uh, dry puncture um, approach. So, so when we're tenting, uh, like in this example here, we are of course tenting the myocardium as well on the other side. It's not just a sort of space on the other side. And um, it's, it's, it's well documented that with, with dry puncture, there's you know, around a 20% um, RV entry rate. And whether or not that leads to problems seems to sort of logically relate to the size of the needle that's being used. So the idea is yeah, a simple one, really. It's to make a real space um, by delivering um, carbon dioxide. So you can see here, this is the left lateral fluoroscopic view. And you can see the pericardial space being inflated. And that's being done via microcatheter. Um, which has been positioned here in the pericardial space. And the microcatheter has been put there by uh, puncturing out the coronary vein. Um, and we've, we, we've seen quite a lot of stuff about coronary veins today. And a lot of the techniques for this are, are in fact, very similar to, to what we saw um, earlier with the two cases. Why CO2? Well, as you've seen, it's, it's easily visible on fluoroscopy, so it makes the... Um, all the steps are visualizable, um, which is, is, is not necessarily the case when you're approaching the heart um, with the dry tap. Um, it has a relatively uh, low density, so that the heart comes posteriorly. If you're lying down, it creates an anterior space. Um, it's not combustible. Um, it's compressible, so it's quite difficult to cause tamponade with it. Um, you can normally easily put at least 100 mils in without causing any drop in systolic blood pressure. And that, that, that will give you two or three centimeters space. It's, it's used widely um, throughout the hospital. So although we're not used to having carbon dioxide in our EP lab, um, our other colleagues are used to using it. It disappears within about 15 minutes from any cavity in the body. Um, and so it's not gonna hang around uh, like nitrogen. It's removed by the lungs first pass. What are the downsides? Well, in theory, um, it's, it's not a good conductor, so it should raise the defibrillation threshold for the time that it's there. It, it will cause tamponade if you keep putting it in. Um, and there may be some uh, issues if it's embolized from the arch to the head. It's actually used for um, 
for vascular imaging if people can't have contrast. So it's not uh, that bad in the arterial system. It's just whether it may be toxic to the brain. So um, where this all started um, from the group in the NIH in the States when they were um, uh, headed by Rob Lederman looking at intentional right atrial exits and they were doing this for work um, to, to find a safe way of getting epicardial access and this is basically what it looks like. This is a video from them. So they've got a balloon catheter in the right atrial appendage and then they're trying to exit through the apex of the appendage with the back end of an angioplasty wire. It doesn't go first time. Second time it goes out, you can see it's now freely moving around the pericardial space. And then the microcatheter is now being advanced. And then they put some CO2 in. And they've used a microneedle actually here. Um, we started doing that, but the, the issue is it's not really necessary to have a microneedle, I don't think. And it adds an extra step because you've got to get back up to the, uh, the larger wires, which you ultimately need for the um, steerable sheath. So, um, why did we choose the coronary vein? Um, it's, it's actually much easier to perforate a coronary vein than the right atrial appendage. Um, it shouldn't bleed too much. Um, you can get very good telescopic support in, in the same way that we, we, we saw um, the two operators today using telescopic support. Um, it's a f familiar place for us. And th there's been a lot of experience with unintentional exit, which doesn't seem to have caused too many problems. Uh, we first um, described this in 2017. So the workflow is, is really straightforward and easy. We cannulate the CS with an agilis. We do a venogram, identify some targets. It doesn't really matter what the targets are. Um, Subselect a branch. Um, we heard earlier from Garcia saying he doesn't like the JR4. Um, so I'm sure that there are you know, other catheters um, that you can use for subselection that may well be better. Um, we then take the microcatheter distally into the branch of the vein over a floppy wire. And then once we position the wire distally, we remove the floppy wire and put a stiff wire in to perforate. Um, and that's a sort of CTO type wire. So there we go. That's just a standard venogram. And you can see there's a couple of nice branches. Here are the tip of the JR4 is in this lower branch. So it seems to have... Um, Yeah, the tip of the JR falls in the lower branch. Oh, it's not carrying on. Um, there we can see the um, microcatheters in a distal position now. And um, we should see a stiff wire come out. And there you can see it just sort of sails out into the pericardial space. Um, and that's really what you want to see with the wire going across to the right side. Um, you can give dye if you want to confirm pericardial positioning. Um, it's good to flush the dye out, the microcatheter, because it's very viscous um, before you put um, the CO2 in. We just use a CO2 tank. It's nothing, it's nothing um, very clever. Um, we pre-fill some syringes. We equalize them to atmospheric pressure because the, the pressure is much higher in the tank, so we know what we're giving. Uh, we monitor for arterial pressure as we go in. And then I think the, the left lateral view is very important, um, uh, in my opinion. So some of the things, I mean, there's, there's other things that you can damage. It's not just the right ventricle, obviously, with epicardial access. There's the liver um, and uh, vessels. So, so yeah, we, we go in very flat, as I'm sure a lot of you do as well. And then what's perhaps a bit different is that we, we puncture vertically up behind the sternum so you can't hit the vessels uh, as well. And so this is what it looks like. So you can actually see there the tenting of the pericardium. And there it's obviously just gone through. And then you can put the wire in. And so this bit really becomes extremely straightforward and, and safe, for, as you can see. Uh, initially, normally, we don't have any blood in the pericardial space. Um, but when you remove the microcatheter out, obviously, you've, you've made a small hole. So you may or may not see a small amount of blood but it's not normally um, uh, an issue. So um, the, the, the sort of more recent paper um, was in a, in a registry of 102 patients, low volume centers, um, very much people on the beginning of their learning curve because it's new as well. Um, yeah, around 100 mils of CO2 given, 
exit in all, all but one um, via the coronary veins. So you can basically always, if you're just patient and, and a bit persistent, you, could, you will always be able to get the wire out into the pericardial space at some point. It may not go anywhere because there might be adhesions, but, but, you, but you would be able to do it. And the, there was one patient, a young woman, whose CS didn't drain into the right atrial appendage, um, uh, didn't dra drain into the right atrium, sorry, who I exited the right atrial appendage, and of course it happened on a live case course. <laughs> um, so, yeah, and, and then of course you could now visualize the adhesions as well. I'll show some examples here. So, uh, this, is a, this is an example where we've exited in, I think, four different locations here, and the wire and microcatheter wasn't going anywhere, and if you put dye, and if you see this sort of appearance, it's very likely that the patient has got widespread, dense pericardial adhesions that there's no way of accessing at all. Okay, that's, that's very dense adhesions. You may, on the other hand, um, have uh, something sort of intermediate adhesions where you can get the wire around, and when you put the CO2 in, you will see tethering of the... Of the, of the RV, for example, in the left lateral view. Um, and, and then you might be able to then aim into a certain pocket um, and potentially move her around. And uh, I know, Bill, you mentioned a, a case recently that you'd done like that. I think in the interest of time, I'm gonna skip the video. Um, I just wanna briefly mention this, um, epicardial access in the setting of AF ablation. Um, whether that's a good idea is another matter, but I, I, I'm just simply talking about it because of the fact that it really does stress the, the technique more than VT ablation, because we were doing it on uninterrupted DOAC, and they were heavily heparinized. So um, you would expect that if there were sort of, uh, you know, a bleeding rate from, from the coronary veins, for example, that this would bring it out. Um, and so we've, we're, we're, we're nearly uh, at 50 cases now, and um, we, we do the transeptal access immediately after, after epicardial access in the way I've just shown, and, and heparinize. And, and we really haven't had um, any bleeding problems related to the access. We have had some bleeding related to the procedure, but not the access. And um, for atrial ablation, you need a posterior access to, the, to, to ablate the, the left atrium. This is just an example of how if you, um, instead of puncturing more anteriorly with the CO2, you can come closer to the acute margin of the RV. And this is an example of then swinging the sheath down and then posterior. So I think it, it does also allow you to um, quite comfortably choose whether you want an anterior or posterior access, should you wish. So in conclusion, um, I, th I think the approach is, is reproducible, safe, uh, it's fast enough. It's got an extremely high access rate. I'm sure the access rate's much higher than, than with the two needles. I don't think it's just safer. I think that you're more likely to get in there. Um, it obviously prevents right ventricular puncture. The learning curve is relatively short. Um, it allows the diagnosis in uh, of, of adhesions, uh, including the density and the distribution of them. Um, you can then avoid that during puncture, and I, I, we're shortly going to publish some data on the fact that it seems to be safe uh, even under full anticoagulation. And uh, that's it. Thank you. Um, Robert and I have discussed. I think we're going to hold off on a discussion section. We're worried about starving you to death. It's been a long day. Appreciate all the speakers of this last session and appreciate great, great cases and great lectures all day long. See you tomorrow.